Okay. Welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome to the first of a series of monthly panel discussions brought to you by the IABC, the International Academy Business Coalition, um, in conjunction with Mr. Techmeyer's fourth hour product team. Um, I am Dr. La Lara Kotari, and I am part of the IABC leadership team. Uh, the IABC is the brainchild of Mrs. Katya Fisher and Mr. Kyle Techmeyer, along with Ms. Gibson and Mr. DeGrazia. Uh, and um, that brings together dedicated parents to connect IA students with the professional community at large, starting with IA parents. The goal is to expose students to various professions to learn from them and their journey and to identify possi uh, possible student internship opportunities in business and other professions. We are excited to kick off the year with our first panel discussion, moderated by students from Mr. Techmeyer's class, product team, um, Michael Nardone and Isaac Toma, who will introduce our Introduce our wonderful panel of guests. Hi, I'm Michael and this is Isaac. Uh, we're here on behalf of You Matter, a club which focuses uh, mostly on mental and physical health. And today we're joined by Miss Mitchell, Dr. Singh, and Dr. Kendall to talk about the importance of sleep. We were wondering if you guys could tell us a little bit about what you do. I'm a board certified psychiatrist and a sleep medicine specialist. And um, I did my training from Mayo Clinic. And I've been in Michigan for 20, almost 20 years. My oldest daughter graduated from here. And um, so I've ha I have a niche practice. I work with professional athletes as well as student athletes and C-suite executives to try and help them fit sleep into their lives. And I've also done some work with um, high school athletes, um, you know, focused on on optimizing sleep and mental health because so that they can optimize uh, overall health and performance. I am Megan Mitchell. I am currently the social emotional learning educator here at International Academy. I started out uh, eons ago as a social worker. I have my bachelor's and master's in social work uh, and started with community mental health and moved into clinical practice while I was getting my education certification. So I also am a certified teacher and I've been in education for 19 years. Uh, and I do also have master's in educational technology and educational leadership. Uh, so all things sleep are things that I am interested in because I'm a big hobbyist when it comes to sleep. I, I enjoy it a lot. So um, we will be talking about that and how it impacts our mental health as well. Hi, my name is Dr. Natasha Kendall, and my background is in marriage and family therapy. My doctorate degree is from Michigan State University. Um, I have been a therapist uh, for well over 20 years, specializing in couples and families. And about five years ago, I started a group practice. Um, we are now a team of 18 professionals, therapists, and uh, psychiatric nurses. And if you're interested in um, learning more about whether my clinical background or the business of psychotherapy, I would be thrilled to share that with you. Um, my older daughter just graduated from IA. Um, just the other day, she texted me, thank God for IB math, because she's in a stats class and she knows exactly what's going on. Um, and my younger daughter is a junior here. Okay, so to start this panel, uh, Dr. Steen, can you tell us about the uh, importance of sleep and the science behind it? You spend one third of your life sleeping. If you're lucky enough to grow to the age of 90, that means you'll have spent a little less than 32 years sleeping. So if sleep did not serve an absolutely vital function, it would be a colossal waste of time. So typically, of course, 
we think of sleep as being uh, rest and restoration for the brain. So anything you learn in school, your brain hits the save button. So all memory is consolidated while you're sleeping. But sleep is also important for emotional regulation. It's important for creativity. So anything you learn during the day, you know, it's while you're sleeping that your brain puts it together with something you've learned and comes up with novel solutions, which is what creativity is. That's what happens. And, um, and it's important for relationships because of emotional regulation. I just said that. So, but apart from the brain, sleep is also important because it forces your body to rest. So every physiological function that you have, it, you know, the restoration so that it's prepared for the next day, so your, for your heart, your lungs, your kidneys, um, every organ undergoes rest and restoration and repair while you're sleeping. So it prepares you for the next day. So our next question is, uh, could you discuss the impact of getting better sleep and how it might decrease the time you spend uh, like working on homework or studying for tests? I think, you know, I, so, so first of all, according to the American Academy of Sleep and Medicine, adolescents need about nine to ten hours of sleep to function well. And you need nine to ten hours of function to function well on a regular basis. And the problem with it, when you when you get less sleep is that the deficits that that accumulate because of sleep deprivation will also accumulate, right? So it progressively gets worse. I think on a daily basis, you know how we set an alarm to set up, to wake up in the morning? It might be a good idea to set an alarm in the evening, so count seven, you know, eight to nine backwards, and then set an alarm for yourself that, that gives you a cue, send you a cue that you have to get ready to start going to bed. And then, um, uh, there are some really simple things that you can do that allow sleep to happen. So, for example, one of them would be that you, you want to try and get off electronics. Um, so, being on social media or playing video games, um, it might seem to you that you're relaxing, but they're actually distracting. And so, you, you know, you, it, it, they actually prevent you from falling asleep. Um, reducing the amount of light you have, um, that, that's a good idea, too. That, that helps you fall asleep. You want to try and avoid drinking too much caffeine close to your bedtime. So any, anything be, uh, you know, beyond two or three in the afternoon is bad for you because it prevents you from, uh, from sleeping well at night. And um, yeah, I think, I think those, are the, those would be some of the pointers I would give. Uh, Ms. Mitchell and Dr. Kenna, is there anything else that you'd like to add to that? I'm doing the math in my head. <laughs> and for most kids here, they're like, nah, it just doesn't add up. School starts at 7.30, I gotta be in my car at 7, I gotta be up at between a quarter to 7. I don't wanna do my hair, 6 if I wanna do my hair. So like, I need to be in bed when? 8 o'clock? I'm not even home until 9 o'clock, right? Or my homework, or it, like I, I know exactly what's going on, right? People are doing the math and they're like, it's not happening, not doing it. So I want to take it a little bit in a different direction. I want to explain the math is perfect. The science is there. We know that, right? What I want to give people is a little different perspective on why. Um, so it's a story. Just bear with me. Um, pretend that on your 16th birthday, you have a new car. Somebody gifts you a beautiful new car. Everything you wanted in one little package with a red bow. All the bells and whistles, newest, latest, gadgetry, everything is right there. And then the person who gives you the vehicle says, I only have one condition, just one. This is the only car you have for the rest of your life. Next day, it's a bit of a snowy, slippery, icy Michigan day, and your friend says, hey, there's a fresh snow and fresh ice. Let's go do donuts in the parking lot. Let's just try your new car. How likely are you, think about this, to do this if you know this is the only car you'll ever have? 
Are you more or less likely to go, sure, let's do it. Most of you are dying and not worth it. Right? So the parable of the car is, of course, you know where I'm going with this. The car is your body. You have one. With the exception of some medical science where a body part can be replaced here and there, that's it. That's all you have. Nutrition, sleep, all of these things is what's going to make this car go to your 120. Or, uh, 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 right? Does that, does that help you kind of think about it differently? This is not optional. This is not a nice city. This is not something you fit in between tennis practice and homework. This is what you start with. And then everything else has to flow around it. Can I? Uh, I love what you just said, and that, that's absolutely right. So don't let the number eight to nine of hours of sleep on a regular basis scare you. That's the goal. But if you're on a regular basic basis getting less sleep, even going to bed 15, 20 minutes earlier, or staying in bed later, or getting a 25 minute nap, so even small additions to your sleep time matter. So it's, it's all a matter of trying to do, to, uh, you know, once, you, once it's on your radar and you know you want to pay attention to it, you can get to it with small increments. That will also work. Can I clarify something? When you say eight, nine, 10 hours, total sleep in a 24 hour period. Yes. Okay, because yes. I'm a champion napper. I can nap every day in any yes. day conditions. That's okay, that's a good thing. Yes, yes, so that's a very good question. So is it eight to nine hours, cumulative hours in a 24 hour period? Yes, it's the total amount of sleep. But remember, you know, how sleepy or alert you are going to be is not just the total number of hours. It also depends on your biological clock. So all of us have a clock in us, in your brain, it's called your circadian clock. And human beings, we are, we, work best, and we are designed best to get the maximum amount of sleep hours at night. You can supplement that by taking naps during the day, but it's not, it's not going to be good quality of sleep. So it's not going to be the best sleep, but that is, but it, but it is cumulative. So yeah, you can try and fit that in. And it's not napping during classes either. <laughs> yes. And uh, Dr. Singh, you mentioned the uh, seeking of rhythm. Could you expand on that a little bit? Sure. So, so all of us, all human beings, we have a clock in our brain, and it's a timekeeping clock, and it keeps time over a 24-hour period, right? So your circadian clock is located in your brain, and when you wake up in the morning, light hits your eye, and hits your circadian clock, and your alert. It you know think of light as a as a alertness pill, and it wakes you up, and then in darkness your brain secretes a hormone called melatonin, which tells you that you're now ready to sleep, which is why we talked about why it's important to not have so much light exposure at night, right? Because then the, the signal to your brain that you're ready to sleep doesn't get generated. So you have the circadian clock that's in your brain, and one of the things that that circadian clock decides is whether you're a night owl or a morning person. So, and teenagers, they're biologically wired to be night owls. So when you get into bed, um, you know, for, so how many of here, how many people here do not fall asleep before, say, midnight? Cannot fall asleep. Raise your hands. Come on, raise your hands higher. Very good. And how about, how about people who, who fall asleep readily at, you know, between, say, 9 and 10 o'clock? Right. So, right. so, so what happens is, so what happens is that you are there are morning people and then there are night people, which means that the time that you fall asleep doesn't really depend on just external things like what time your school begins, but also gets decided by your your basic biology. The problem is that the school times are are fixed and you can't really move them. So, so for the people who cannot fall asleep till later because they're night out and they have to still wake up, perhaps taking a short nap during the day would be a good idea because that might be a way to get sleep. All right, so um, we asked students and we found a lot of them do take naps after school, but um, there's a lot of varying information about sort of like how long you should take a nap, 
if you should leave a gap of a few hours before you're going to sleep. Could you talk about that? Okay, so um, so so there are three things to consider when you're taking when you're thinking about naps, right? The first is the timing. So you can take a 15 to 25 minute nap, that's called a power nap. And then you know, when you when you wake up from a power nap, you wake up from light sleep, so you should, you know, it, it takes a bite out of your sleep drive, so you really should feel alert. So a slightly longer nap is about 30 to 35 minutes. You're still waking up from, you know, still the lighter stages of sleep, so that's also restorative. Then there's like, you know, the granddaddy nap, which is a full sleep cycle. That's approximately 90 minutes, and that's what, say, NBA or NHL players do, because they don't get enough sleep at night, so they have to take they take these long naps during the day. That's when people live in, you know, in countries where they take siestas. That's what they do. They take that full sleep cycle in the mid afternoon. Now, so there is the length of the nap. Then there's a timing. Of course, the best timing is during the mid afternoon when there's a slight dip in our alertness. Right? That's a good time. And sometimes that all this food, so you, you don't want to take it then. But perhaps as soon as you get home, that's a good time to take a nap. And then the third thing is you don't want to take a nap too close to your bedtime, because then that might prevent you from falling asleep at night. So you want to you want to keep at least three or four hours before your actual you know bedtime is. I will say that if there are if there are students or if there are teachers who have difficulty initiating and maintaining sleep at night then you don't want to take a nap. So there are some circumstances in which a nap is a bad thing. Do you have anything else that you guys would like to add? Okay, well, yeah, switching the subject just a little bit, uh, you know, some of the students also had a question about how your diet may affect, you know, how you sleep, and also, uh, like, the time that you eat as well. So, um, so how diet affects you. So remember I talked about that circadian clock which talks about every 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 function in your, in your body has a time when it's resting and a time when it's awake. So think about it, if you eat anything too late, you're sending the wrong signal to your stomach because you're telling your stomach that instead of getting ready to go to sleep, you should wake up because now's the time to, you know, there's food coming and so digestion should happen. So typically, you don't want to eat within an hour or two hours of your bedtime, and you especially don't want to eat like a heavy, spicy meal because that would uh, make it more difficult for you to sleep. So that's number one. Then second thing is you don't want to have any, you don't want to have snacks too close to your bedtime that contain caffeine, and one of the things that contains caffeine is chocolate. So you know, chocolate or even even a hot chocolate drink might be might seem react um, you know relaxing, but actually will make it difficult for you to fall asleep. Um, you know, when it comes to the content of food, actually, uh, carbohydrate-rich foo uh, foods are actually better for sleep at night. So that's the, the third thing. So I would I would keep it really simple. Don't eat within two to three hours of going to bed. Make sure you don't have snacks that are heavy in caffeine. And um, if possible, you know, like for example, nuts or something that contains some amount of um, uh, protein is good. I mean, you know, on the other hand, you know, you don't want to go to bed hungry because you don't want to wake up in the middle of the night when, when you're starving either. I would like to add something to that. The science is the science, and it's great. We need to know the facts. And you are the best judge of yourself. Right? These things are very individualized in terms of. Are you an early bird? Are you a night owl? What's better for your tummy? What's worse for your tummy? And these things change throughout life. Right? So as we get older, maybe that meal time has to be moved earlier and earlier and earlier. I'm finding myself making a reservation with my mom, who's 86. We're eating dinner at 4 o'clock. That's what grandma needs. Right? So you have to like really be in tune with yourself and your needs while aware of the science. All right, so um, we found a lot of students uh, drink a lot of caffeine in order to stay awake. We were wondering if there are any long-term effects of consuming a lot of caffeine. So, um, so, so caffeine, so when you're, 
Well, let me, let me start with the, with the science part, right? The longer you're awake at night, the longer a certain chemical, no, actually, the longer you're awake during the day, the longer, the more a chemical gets secreted in your brain. And that's, uh, it's called adenosine, and it goes and attaches uh, to that part of the brain that makes you more sleepy. And what caffeine does is it, it goes and gets attached to the same part, the same receptor, and so it blocks the effect of um, adenosine. So it makes you, it does make you more alert, it helps, improves your accuracy, and it also makes you, you know, uh, makes you feel less sleepy. Now, caffeine takes about 15 to 20 minutes to take effect, but then its half-life is about five to six hours, which means if you drink caffeine um, in the morning, 10 hours later, half of it might still be in your system. And then, of course, it's complicated. So some people are fast met metabolizers, some are slow. So it, it's really, it's, it's different for, for different people. But the one thing that I like to tell people is that what, you know, caffeine can make you feel less sleepy, it can make you faster, it can make you more accurate. But the one part, thing that it does not affect is your judgment. So when you're sleep deprived, you know, that part of the brain that's responsible for good decisions and good judgment is preferentially impaired. And caffeine doesn't affect it. So when you're caffeinated, and you're sleep deprived, you just continue to make bad decisions faster. Because you're not only faster, but your judgment has an improved. So, you know, well, the long-term effects of sleep deprivation are that, you know, you can develop obesity, you can develop, you know, heart disease, etc. And if you mask that with caffeine for, uh, temporarily, it will not prevent those uh, long-term uh, you know, detrimental effects to health from happening. I would also like to add that caffeine um, and anxiety are very closely linked. So if you are prone to anxiety, have a history of anxiety disorders in your family, if you have anxiety, it is a bad idea to be drinking caffeine. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily feel that you are anxious. You feel, yep, yeah, I'm ready to go, I'm awake, I'm alert. Um, but it really impairs judgment, and it also really impairs emotional regulation. And what I mean by that is, your ability to be as mature as you can at your age and soothe yourself. Um, people tend to uh, be very emotionally up and down. Right? That could be sleep deprivation um, mixed with caffeine, so you do it faster. So then, you know, we always we've been talking about like reasons why you're not sleeping. Is there any way to now like help yourself fall asleep? Well, one of the things is cut out the caffeine. Uh, and the stimulants that you're ingesting in the evenings uh, will definitely keep you up, but we need to establish a good habit uh, and cultivate those sleep patterns. If you are not uh, putting away your phones before you go to bed, I hate to tell you, but the best way to bring down uh, and kind of get ready to um, what we talked about, uh, like start the, the down. wind down, right, is to put the phone away, the electronics away, and turn the lights down about an hour before you're about ready to go to bed. That little blue uh, light coming out of the phones is going to, to keep your mind alert, and it's not going to let you uh, fall asleep as fast as you could. So um, setting a technology curfew would be a great start, and telling yourself at whatever time, 10 o'clock, I gotta put this down and start to wind down. Turn dim the lights, get ready, make sure your bed's as comfortable as it can be, but you really have to start a routine. And if you focus on it, you'll improve it. Doesn't mean you're gonna get the best night's sleep just because you started it, but you need to, to take a step and, and go from something. Yeah, I, so I wanna tell you that there has been research that shows that if you have a telephone by your bedside when you're sleeping, you don't progress to the deeper stages of sleep. So just by the, you know, even if the phone didn't go off, because part of your brain is always in anticipation of waiting for a phone call, so you really don't progress to the deeper stages of sleep. And then, you know, just tagging on to what you had said, um, you know, 
So, so perhaps with the, uh, you know, perhaps it is difficult for you to fit enough hours of sleep at night. But if you did use an alarm to tell you that it was time to start getting ready for bed, and one of the things that you did at that time is put away the phone and put away electronics, and if you were reading a book, you would allow sleep to happen faster. Because it's not just the blue light that makes it more difficult for you to fall asleep, but it's the interactive quality with the telephone. So, you know, just doing that small step will really help you fall asleep faster. I want to be a bit of a devil's advocate. There's one use of the phones that I really feel is helpful to some people some of the time. And that's to play um, a meditation audio or um, a very boring bedtime story. <laughs> I know it sounds ridiculous, but for some people, meditation um, is actually more stressful and more anxiety provoking. Their brain does not wind down and turn off. Their brain just gets wrapped around its axle, thinking about 25 to-dos and tests, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So for people like that, I recommend instead of just meditation, straight meditation audios, to try um, they're called bedtime stories for adults. Um, they are very soothing, very boring stories. Um, the one that I like is about 23 minutes long. I swear to you, I've listened to it for maybe three years now. I have never heard the end of the story. I don't know how it ends. I'm always asleep before the 23 minute mark. Um, it's boring, but it's also, it, it gets my thoughts to stop spinning, because I'm listening to what the author is trying to say. <laughs> don't know. Um, and that's in an app called Calm. Yeah, I, I, you know that's a, that's a very good point. So when you are in, if you're in bed and your mind, if you can't stop your mind from from uh, racing or thinking, it's if you command, if you try to command it to do so, it's going to make it exactly like it's going to make it much worse, right? And so. The easier thing to do would be to distract your mind by doing something and listening to a story or listening to a podcast would take your mind away from the distracting thoughts and you wouldn't be paying attention to the fact that you're waiting for sleep to happen. So those are, that's the reason why you, it would be easier to fall asleep. Um, uh, yeah, the only thing is the discipline that it takes not to reach for the phone. Right? And, and, do it. Yeah. and turn the phone upside down so the light is not on. It has to be. All right, so we were wondering if, other than the things you guys are talking about, you had any advice on breaking bad sleep habits? Well, being a classroom teacher, I had to go to sleep and get enough sleep to, to be on in the classroom every day, so I had to break the habit of being up. Um, and just like watching TV and doing whatever it is I wanted to do. So I had to get into the habit. I go to bed every night at 11, and every single person in my life that speaks to me in the evening knows that I go to bed at 11. So the more people you get to support you and not reach out to you and make sure they aren't trying to get uh, pieces of you when you're, you're winding down and, and creating that sleep schedule, would be the first step. That's what I have to do. Uh, and I, like I said, sleep is my best friend because I sleep from 11 to 6. And those are my, do not interrupt me unless it's an emergency time and everybody knows it for me. So for me, it's to set a schedule and stick to it and make sure others are supporting me with that schedule. I really love the word habit in that question. So I want to talk for a minute about that word habit. Um, Any time that you have something that needs to be changed, a health behavior, let's say, whether it is nutrition-based, sleep-based, um, motivation-based, procrastination, whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish for yourself, I think of it as 20%, 40%, 40%. 20% information. Why is this important? We have the health science in this example, right? 40% is motivation. Why is, it, why is it important to me? 
What will it do for me? I need motivation to do it for myself. And the other 40% is habit. You start a health change by motivation, by feeling, I got this, I totally, I, I can do this, it's important. But you continue any habit with habit, right? So it is that alarm clock that goes off at 10 o'clock and says, time to wind down. Or it's the habit of telling your friends and family, don't contact me. Or whatever that habit looks like for you, that's that last 40%. And without the habit in place, Motivation alone won't do it. Okay, well, uh, now we're going to move on to some questions asked by those in classrooms right now. And the first one that, uh, well, one that stood out to me was, sometimes I sleep uh, 10 hours and still feel tired. Why is this? So, um, you know, that pattern in which during the weekdays or school days you're getting less sleep and then on the weekends you're playing catch up and you're sleeping longer. Although you want to sleep longer because you want to play catch up, just, you know, it's, the reason why they feel tired is because they're, because you're not doing, not getting enough sleep on a regular basis. And I, the only analogy I can think of right now is that if you, if you, you know, eat pizzas and get burgers all weekday, every weekday, and then only on the weekend decide that you're going to eat healthy food, it's not going to really help, right? You really have to try and do the healthy stuff on a regular basis. A couple of additions to that. Um, for some people, 10 hours is not enough, right? You said 8 to 10 on average. You may be an 11 hour person. You may be that person who is at optimal performance after 11 hours. So that's possible. You, again, you need to know yourself. Secondly, feeling overly tired, sleepy, unreasonably tired during the day um, is one of the symptoms of depression. It is probably one of the first things people notice and bring to me and they say, I used to be fine. My day, you know, I get a little tired towards the evening. What is happening? I feel like I'm dragging. Right? So if that's a continual um, two, three weeks problem, you need to be assessed. Um, it, it's also a symptom of other fighting other things. Mono, for example, right? Just feeling um, is it, is it pediatrician? I'm sure there are many more. Would you like to add a couple more things to watch out for if people are just too tired? Um, I mean, I think that if it's associated with other symptoms as well, then so it could be a, um, a sign that something else broader might be going on. So, so be in tune with your body and talk to your parents. And if there's concern, then talk to your doctor. Uh, that would be sort of the next so I did want to um, talk a little bit about strategies, and I think we've already heard a little about uh, some of the strategies that our panelists have suggested, um, cut back on caffeine, develop good sleep habits, uh, good use of um, power naps, and doing it appropriately. Uh, but I know that there are some of you out there that might think, you know, I'm in school all day, I go to a sport after that or some activity, and then I lead, you know, three different clubs and I have a job. And how, and I, I just can't. So what other strategies might there be to time manage uh, that could maybe help get, uh, increase our productivity and still be able to get sleep? I was going to let you answer the time management part, but I just want to say something. The way that our school system is set up right now, in which, especially if it's if it's beginning any time before eight fifteen in the morning, and uh, you know, uh, that is against the biology of how teenagers are wired. So, you know, so teenagers and high school students, if they try their level best and use all the strategies of the world in which, you know, they're using napping, they're putting away their phones, they're trying to get as much sleep in, they still are going to be fighting their natural biology of their circadian rhythms if they're trying to wake up uh, before, you know, if they're trying to get to school before 8, 15 in the morning. And so that requires strategy really at, at an organization level. It's not something, you, you know, you can't really... Uh, students are really can't do much about it if if the 
the, the locus of control doesn't lie within them. They really can't make that change. I want to talk about a strategy of um, on and off when we're talking about work. Um, you can call it batching, you can call it 40, 45, 15, 50, 10. There's all kinds of names out there in the literature for this strategy. But it's as basic as it gets. When you are working, um, schoolwork in particular, homework, you should only be doing schoolwork. When you are not working, when you are on break, you should only be on break. What I'm finding happens to all of us, trust me, all of us, is we are working on an essay, on a math problem, um, on a presentation, and then a phone dings, and all of a sudden I'm not working so much. I am checking who wants what from me, and I'm responding. So that momentary, mon momentary switch of attention is actually extremely detrimental to your productivity. It feels to you, it's going to take a second, let me just see what's going on, but actually it takes your brain a significant amount of time to get back to what you were supposed to be doing. So 45-15 is a strategy that worked personally for me really well. I'm working for 45 minutes and that means my phone is actually not anywhere where it will distract me. Um, and then and then an alarm goes off, and I know that I have 15 minutes to grab a snack, to check my phone, to check with my family members, see what the dog wants, whatever needs to be done, and I'm not working at that time. And I repeat that 45, 15, as long as necessary. Yeah, I, th I think we need to recognize what our thought patterns are doing for us, and we need to work smarter, not harder. And one of those is to recognize any toxic mindsets that we have developed or that we're encouraging in ourselves or others. So if we're wearing the lack of sleep as a badge of honor because woohoo, we think we're more productive, we might have a little bit of a shift we have to make. So when you are up late at night working on things, it's not necessarily to your betterment. Um, and so the science and everything we've discussed is, is trying to point that out. So let's shift that that mindset and work on with ourselves and with our friends and peers that when people are talking about a, a lack of sleep, we're not encouraging that and that we're actually addressing it and talking about it as something that shouldn't be continued. So the, the toxic way that we're, we're dealing with it should be addressed. I, I have a challenge for these students. I've heard every word you said, and I have a challenge for these students. You guys are a very attentive audience. Next time you get nine or ten hours of sleep, I want you to text three of your friends and brag about it. I want you to be proud that you did that good thing for your body because that will start a positive spiral in their minds rather than bragging how little sleep you got, how tired you are, how whatever you did between 11 and four in the morning, text your friends and say, I need some validation and support. Like, I did this, 10 hours, I feel great. Or, and I don't feel so good, I should do that 17 more times. In fact, I think we might need a new sleep club here. I look at it the, the club fair, and I'll sponsor that. If I can get 10 students who we're all gonna get all the sleep at night, let's join the club. We'll meet in my room for a power nap. All right, so I noticed you mentioned teenagers fighting against their natural biology when trying to go to bed early. I was wondering if you would recommend a supplement like melatonin to help with that? Absolutely no. <laughs> Is there any supplement? Pretty simple answer. What? The question was, any supplement that Dr. Singh would recommend? I think, I mean, I think Dr. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, as long as you're eating a healthy, normal, American diet, and if you're, you know, the multi multivitamins that you eat, that's, you know, that's more than enough. 
there is a recommendation that you can use you can use use some magnesium if you want, but this, the research out there is not enough for me to make a comment on whether you should or shouldn't. But I can tell you that my recommendation would be to not use melatonin unless it's under the advice of an actual physician. Could you talk about how to uh, optimize production of your own melatonin? There are a couple of things that we can do to help our body produce the melatonin that we need. To make sure that by, be <laughs> by making sure that uh, you're exposed to darkness because melatonin is secreted in darkness. And I heard about early morning exercise, like getting light and exercise in the morning, not early, early. That's, that's what does it at night. True, True or false? Yes. So, you know, as the darkness is, you need darkness for your brain to secrete melatonin. And in, when you're exposed to uh, darkness at the right time, your brain will automatically secrete the melatonin. So, if you were exposed to, like, if, if, if you were in the dark in the mid-afternoon, you're not going to have melatonin secretion. Uh, uh, what, uh, the one way to make sure that you strengthen your circadian rhythms is to have bright light exposure during the day and to have exercise during the day. So in, either in the morning or in the early afternoon is a good idea because that's what also helps strengthen your circadian rhythms. So now we're going to move on to questions from the audience. So Michael's going to come around with a mic and if you have a question just raise your hand and he'll come around to you. Hi, sorry, I was just wondering if you could like recommend any tips for staying awake during class. I know some of the classes can get like really warm and some of the teachers have like really nice voices that just like really nice. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, so I think it depends on the if you're up and about, if you're an under bright light, if you're motivated, if you're moving, uh, you know, you're, it's less likely to, for you to fall asleep, right? So you're, even if, however sleepy you are, you're very unlikely to fall asleep when you're jogging because it's, you know, that's just not what's gonna happen. But quiet, boring, dull, sedentary situations will unmask sleepiness. So if you're in a classroom where it's kind of quiet, if you're sitting around, you, you know, getting up and you know walking around might help. Um, so anything that will change your state is going to prevent you from falling asleep. So I would say that. The other thing I want to say is that uh, quiet, dull, boring situations will unmask sleepiness, which makes driving a very dangerous situation. Because when you're driving, you're, you're sitting down and it's quiet. Uh, dull and boring. So it's, that's why it's it's kind of important to keep that in mind. You might feel perfectly fine during school, and you're up, you know, you're interacting with people, etc. And then you sit down in your car and you're driving home. That time you might fall, feel sleepy, and it's because you've been sleepy all along. But then it's it's the situation that has unmasked it. So my work is done in quiet, dark, peaceful rooms, usually with one person. Not necessarily. And if that person is quiet, depressed, um, it is hard. So what works is uh, small sips of cold water. It's either water or the temperature or just the action of me moving because I can't walk around. Um, mint, mint gum or mint um, chews, something, and movement. That, that really works. I have to tell you that um, I work for one of the, the NFL teams and, uh, you know, when they have team meetings, it's really boring, they're kind of sitting down. And so, and, and so the, um, the head coach would fine anybody who fell asleep $5,000 every time they fell asleep, so they would get up and pace. And I, yes, those are really good, those are really good countermeasures if you're falling asleep in a, in a room. But if you're falling asleep, or if you're drowsy while driving, none of that's going to work. So the best thing to do at that point would be to pull over and take a nap. 
Um, another question is, you were saying before bed, don't like use electronics, stay off social media, all that stuff. But what if, let's say, your homework is onset electronics, and you had, again, activities and clubs before you could do your homework? So your homework is lining up like before your time that you're going to go to bed. How do you do that without having to push back your bedtime? Can you go to bed and then do your homework in the morning? So one reason why waking up in the morning would be okay for you and I and not for them is because they're night owls, right? So biologically, that, that would be the exact wrong time for you guys to do your homework, which is early in the morning. However, however, there are, there are ways in which you can do your homework and, you know, sometimes you can get these glasses that block blue light. And, or if you're on, if you're doing, I don't know if there'd be any reason for you to be doing your homework on a telephone or like on your smartphones, but if that is the case, there is an app called Grayscale, which removes the blue um, and, the, and the colorful light, lights in it. So I would, you know, I would, you could do that. And um, uh, yeah, you know, and it's also, it's also what you were talking about is that you don't want to have, you know, you don't want to have your computer on as, and your phone on for entertainment too, because then you're not paying attention to, to both of them together. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I work mostly in the morning, so yeah, that works for me, but I'm not sure it's going to work for them. Um, I have a quick question. So you said that we shouldn't be exposed to blue light an hour before bed, but Let's say, like you set an alarm for 30 seconds, like 10 minutes before you go to bed. Would that like reset that hour, or does like the duration matter as well? Can you ask me that question again? Yeah. So, like, let's say, like within the hour before sleep, you use your phone for like 30 seconds to like set an alarm. Would that reset the hour, or not? Well, yes. I mean, I it would reset the hour, and the reason why it would be is because it's typically not realistically speaking it's typically not 30 seconds right because the phone is interactive it is addictive you pick it up and you say well i'm going to be on it for 30 seconds and you know 15 minutes have passed by but yes yeah that would so and and so there's science for that because even if you have the, there are studies in which they just send pulses of light to see if that will suppress your your melatonin and even those pulses of light is yeah, is enough. So we we have so time work for only one more question, one or two more questions, I think. I yeah. Think um, it's just super quick. Oh yeah. You wanted to set an alarm, and you were very dedicated to setting an alarm for bedtime. Target carries alarm clocks, bedtime box. <laughs> I'm. Do you have any advice to stay asleep for the whole night? That's a great question. Sorry, what was the question? Are there any tips to stay asleep for the whole night? Staying asleep, I'm going to stay asleep. So staying asleep is an issue? Yeah. So when people fall asleep, kid, any time beyond the age of six months, you fall into sleep, to, and you fall into sleep through light sleep, then you have deep sleep, and then you have dream sleep, and then you wake up. That's an approximately 90 minute cycle, and you cycle through these different stages of sleep all through the night. So in fact, all your life, every 90 minutes or so, you've woken up, most times you wake up, go back to sleep, and do not remember it. So whenever people say that they wake up in the middle of the night and they have difficulty going back to sleep, my first question would be, what are you doing after you wake up? So firstly, of course, what wakes you up? Is it like external noise? Do you have to go to the bathroom? You know, it, what's waking you up? But then what's happening after that that's preventing you from going back to sleep? And I'll tell you, many times when people wake up in the middle of the night, they reach for a phone. And they, so they look at their telephone, they, they tell what time it is, and then subconsciously they, they think back and say, well, I, I went to bed at this time, and I have this thing to do the next day. And it w wakes them up even further. So if you are 
if you occasionally wake up in the middle of the night and have difficulty going back to sleep, avoid looking at that phone and listen to that boring book, book that Do uh, Dr. Kendall was talking about. If, however, this happens on a chronic basis, you need to see somebody. Right. So these are automatic negative thoughts is what happens, and automatic negative thoughts is what happens when you wake up and you know for a fact you will be so tired tomorrow, right? So those negative thoughts is what's going to keep you more awake and more alert because then it becomes a spiral of doom. And I'm going to fail my quiz, and I'm going to fail this class, and I'm going to be a bad lady on the street. Yeah, it goes just boom, boom, boom. Um, so learning to counteract and work with your own automatic negative thoughts is huge. Um, and that's something that you can work with a the therapist, um, and you can work with Ms. Mitchell on that. We have a resource right here in the building on um, how to not believe everything that you say to yourself inside your own head. And you won't believe everything you read um, in social media, online, when you do your own research, or critical thinkers. But somehow things that happen inside my head, like, oh yeah, that sounds right. Um, so really challenging your own negative thoughts and beliefs, whether it's in the middle of the night or with homework. So these are all fantastic questions, and um, it, uh, we won't have time to answer all the questions. Um, we are nearing the end here, and so we have room for time for one more question. Who's created so patiently? And so go ahead and ask your question. Hi. Whoa. Okay. I'm just going to do this. Um, first of all, thank you all so much for being here. Um, it's been really good advice, and so thank you very much. But. I also feel like that's only half the battle. I don't think anyone here is willingly staying up until 2 a.m. Well, I can name names. Um, but a vast majority of the people that are staying up late, I don't think they're doing it because they want to. I think they're doing it because they feel that they have to. So what recommendations could you make, especially for like teachers and administration, to get that other half of the battle done and alleviate the stress that's making us stay up until two. To help address part of that is um, being part of the staff, we are talking about uh, the, and, and all of our students took a, a survey regarding a lot of our stressors, and, and a lot of that is homework and the amount of assignments. And so none of your teachers are assigning anything um, that is going to give you hours and hours each oh. night. <laughs> going to do to work as a as a collective school community is when you've hit 30 minutes in a class of just a basic assignment move on to the next one so every other day you're seeing the classes every other day so we're going to work together on that teachers have an understanding of, of what your stressors are and what the assignments are needed you sometimes do have those bigger assignments that we need to make sure we're not procrastinating on. However, having just sat through a staff meeting, I know that your teachers are going to address with you the amount of time that an average assignment will be take, giving you, um, or take, should be taking you. So we will all work together to, to address this need. As, at least, and if we're not, then come and talk to me. Could I just clarify, can I clarify that? Are you saying that after each class should have no more than 30 minutes of homework per night. So two hours total for okay. So that's the for an average that's the goal. Okay, just there. Thank you. I gotta. I want to say something. I think that's. I think that's a fantastic question. A very valid question. Right. And I, we can we can sit here and talk about sleep, and we can talk about science, and we can talk about mental health. But you. But these kids cannot control what is out of their control. And, and there is a national start school later program that is going on right now. So, and it's, and, and the government, you know, the legislation is also involved. And the scientific community, especially the sleep scientific community, is trying to get together with 
uh, lawmakers because they want to change the time school begins. Because it's just the, the time that the school begins is so long for the biology at this time. And then in, in addition to that, when, you, when these kids are already not getting enough sleep, if you put you know, extra homework, well, you can't, you can't put handcuffs on people and then, then expect them to fight. You really have to, uh, you have to put the scaffolding around them so that they're able to succeed. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Kendall, Dr. Singh, and Ms. Mitchell. And now, if, if you guys have any more questions, Dr. Kendall will be in room 310, and Dr. Singh and Ms. Mitchell will be in rooms 308. And can we get another quick round of applause? <laughs> All the questions that you guys have sent in, which is um, great. Uh, please feel free to send it to the IABC uh, Gmail, iabusinesscoalition at gmail.com, or you can forward it to Dr. Mr. Jack Meyer and he'll get it, um, and we can forward it to the specialist to see if we get some answers. Thank you again, everyone.